Welcome, Fellowship Asheville. No matter who you are or where you are, we really are a church for you. Now, I'm going to share something with you today that I don't think I have ever talked about publicly. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever taken a dance class before? Right? Maybe ballet, uh, jazz, western, or modern dance. Well, have I ever told you about the time that I was involved in a modern dance routine? Let me tell you what modern dance is. Modern dance is basically storytelling through movement. And if you've ever seen a modern dance, uh, you know that it can range from anywhere from the beautiful to the absolutely bizarre, right? Well, one time I was the director and choreographer of a modern dance. Let me, let me explain. Um, this was during my graduate work at seminary. And I was taking a class called Trinitarianism. And Trinitarianism is a class that studied the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And this class in particular was, was an awesome class, very thought-provoking. And not only for the exams and multiple papers we had to do, we had to do a major project at the end of the class to kind of summarize all the stuff that we had learned. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do, and one day I was actually driving home. One night I was driving home late from seminary, and I was listening uh, to this music. I was listening to Sarah Brightman, and this song came on. And as I was driving down the highway, heading home, listening to this song, I had this picture in my head. I had this vision, and I believe it was this God-given vision of this dance unfolding as this song progressed. And this dance told the story of the Trinity, including the resurrection and and including the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And, you know, as this song went on and as this picture in my head kept going through this music, uh, towards the end of it, I just started, I just got teary eyed as I was driving down the highway by this story and this picture that was in my head. Now, when all this happened, I was working for a college ministry at a liberal arts school. And we had some people in the ministry uh, that were getting their degree in dance. And so I pulled three of them together and I played the music and I told them the story of this dance. And, and, and I, I described each step and each action as I believe God had given it to me. And when I finished describing the vision of this dance, like they were in tears and they said they would do it. All of a sudden, what I didn't know I was going to do for this major project, which was a major part of my grade, all of a sudden I realized, y'all, I am turning in a modern dance for my, my, for my project. Well, we practiced it. And when I say we, I mean, I directed, choreographed, they danced it. So don't picture me doing modern dance because that's not what happened. Right? They, they, they did this and then we filmed it and it came time to turn it in. And so I walk into class and I've got a videotape. This was the 90s, so it was a VHS tape. And a one-page description of the elements of this dance. And I put it on the desk and, 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 and all these other projects were being turned in. And y'all, these projects like landed on the desk like this. They were thick and bound and it was these major, major works that people did. And, and I've got to tell you, in that moment, I felt like a fool for turning in a dance for a major project. I regretted it because I thought, what in the world? I am not a choreographer. I am definitely not a dancer. What in the world was I thinking? Well, then the day came to get the grade back. And it was towards the end of the class and we got our project back. And what was interesting, I don't remember the videotape being returned to me. I just remember the piece of paper being returned to me. And it just had a grade at the top with a circle on it. It had 115 with a circle. And my first thought was, oh no, like the, the, the metric that the professor used to grade this must have been 200. Like, certainly I scored about a 55 on this thing. And so I, I just knew that I, was, I had failed this major project, meaning I'd probably have to take the class again. And I turned to the guy next to me, who was a friend of mine. I said, so what, what did you get on your project? Because he had written a paper. And, and he looked at me grinning ear to ear and said, a 93. He goes, what did you get? And so I just showed him my paper that said 115. And I realized 
the grading scale wasn't 200. The grading scale was 100. And not only did I ace this project, that professor gave me an unexpected 15 points on this major project. He gave me this unexpected extra credit on that. And not only did he give me extra points, he did something else extra. He gave me this extra honor because the reason I didn't have the videotape is that he wanted to show it to the entire class. And recently, he and I reconnected over Facebook, and he let me know he has shown that project to every class that he has taught since then on Trinitarianism. Now, why do I share this with you? Not that you'll uh, line up for the next dance that I'm involved in. I share this with you for this, because I want us to focus on this one word today, and this word is extra, right? Right? Now, my professor gave me extra credit. He gave me extra honor. And in keeping my project and in showing it to all these other classes and in giving me the, these extra points and this extra honor and, and this extra attention, he did something. He, he changed me in many ways because I went from feeling like a fool for turning in something that was way outside of my comfort zone and, and way outside of what I thought I was able to do And I went from feeling like a fool to being seen and appreciated and even having my creativity and my knowledge valued by one of the smartest men that I know. Because you see, church, this is what extra does. Extra is going beyond what people expect. Extra is going beyond what people expect. It's doing more. Kids, here's what extra is. Extra is when your, your parents, your mom or your dad ask you to clean your room. And going extra is not just cleaning your room, but cleaning the bathroom that you use. It's not just cleaning the bathroom, but it's cleaning the closet. It's not just cleaning the closet, but it's cleaning under the bed. You know, that place where you stick the stuff that you actually don't want to put away? It extra is cleaning up that space. But here's what extra does. Because y'all listen to me, this is what it did to me. Our extra, the extra that we give, actually elevates the receiver. The, see, the person who receives your extra, whether it's extra credit for those of you who are teachers, whether it's extra attention or, or extra work or extra obedience, they feel elevated. They feel special. They feel heard. They feel seen. They feel honored. What it looks like is, is their shoulders, they walk with, with their shoulders more straight and their chin higher. Well, today we're going to see lots, lots of extra. And we're going to see it elevate the one who receives it, which is really cool. But y'all, what I'm really excited about is we're also going to talk about what extra shows us about ourselves. We're also going to talk about what the extra we give shows us about ourselves. Now, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 2, verses 14 through 23. And so if you have your Bibles at home, go ahead and find it and open it up. And, or, or you can turn your Bible on and, and, and turn there. And as you're turning there, I just want you to remind you we're in this series called Pause. Because in the book of Ruth, we see all these, all these little pauses. And today's pause is to pause for extra. Pause to give extra. Now, if you remember where we left off last week, Ruth, Ruth was working in Boaz's field. Remember, she had shown up and she was working in his field. And we saw Boaz use his power and privilege and, and give Ruth this, this connection, give her community, give her safety, and give her provision. And all of that was, was through her work. Where now we're going to see they actually take a break to eat. Right, And so they've been working, and they take this break to eat. Now, let's, let's dive in. And I want you to, as I read, I want you to look for the extra. So verse 14, chapter 2 says this. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain. Right, So he sits down, they, they come in to eat, and she, he says, here, come sit with, with the people you've been working with. Come sit with the reapers. Now, if you remember, yesterday he said that she could drink the water that they drink and that she is to glean after them. Well, here we see Boaz invite her to join the table with the hired workers. And remember, most likely these were a lot of his extended family. So not only does she get to work, In this community, she also gets to eat with them. And this is really the first extra that we see from Boaz to Ruth is this extra community, right? Because sharing a meal with people is really fun. Do you remember when we used to do that? Remember when we used to share meals with people? 
Well, that's really fun, and it builds community. And this is what Ruth, this is what Boaz has done for Ruth. Look at the rest of verse 14. It says, And she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. And so here we see that, that he passed her the grain, which was a common meal there. And, and not only did she eat to her feel, fill, she had some leftover. She got to take a to-go box with her. And here we see this other extra. It's this extra provision. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 says this. And when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young man, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. And do not reproach her. Now, this is, this is key because we saw last week, Boaz said, listen, don't touch her. He told his, the, the men that are working with her, don't touch her. Let, her. let her glean. And now we see him tell the workers, don't reproach her. Kids, if you're listening, let me tell you what this word reproach means. It means that these workers are to watch their words around her. It means they're not to shame her. They're not to humiliate her. They're to watch their words around her. They're not to let her regret working in this field. I mean, remember, Ruth is a foreigner to them, right? She's from this place called Moab. And so in many ways, she's an enemy to the nation of Israel. And yet, there she is working shoulder to shoulder with them. Y'all, it would be real easy for them to say things under their breath to her just so she could hear them. It'd be real easy for for them to bully her with her words. It'd be real easy for for them to go kind of all mean girl on her, right? But not only are they not to touch her, they are to use kind words to her. And so here Boaz is giving her extra safety, even from what we saw last week. Look at verse 16. Verse 16, and also pull out, some, pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean. Do not rebuke her. And so now he takes this up even one more notch. He goes even more extra. There's extra provision and extra safety. Boaz goes all kinds of extra for Ruth. Well, let's see her response in, in verse 17. Verse 17 says this, and so she gleaned in the field until evening. And then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And so what was her response? She worked, right? She worked in the field. She worked besides the reapers. And, and what's interesting, the amount of food that she collected in that one day, I read different commentators, and it ranges anywhere from five days worth of food to two weeks worth of food when you think that it was just for her and Naomi, her mother-in-law. That's, that's a lot of food for them. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 says this, and then she took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned and she also brought out, uh, brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. So not only, now imagine this, she comes home with all this stuff and she puts it on the table for, for Naomi and then she also pulls out the to-go box that she had from, left over from lunch and, and shows her that. And so she dumps all this out. And now if you remember Naomi, let's let's catch you up on Naomi if you're just now joining us. Naomi was her mother-in-law. And Naomi is the reason that Ruth is in Israel to begin with. Because if you remember, Naomi and her husband Elimelech left Israel and and to go into Moab with her two sons. And, And while Naomi was in Moab, her husband died and her sons married. And then her sons died. And so she was left with these two daughter-in-laws. And one daughter-in-law stayed there in Moab, but, but Ruth stayed with Naomi. And when they came back to the nation of Israel, Naomi's name means pleasant. And everybody was like, Naomi, is that you? You know, in other words, they're saying pleasant. Is that you in, in the Hebrew language? And what Naomi said is she was like, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. And she said, because this is what God has done to me. He has made me bitter because she's lost her husband. and She's lost her sons and now she's coming back to Israel and she has nothing with her besides, besides Ruth. Well, that's Naomi. Now all this food is laid out in front of her from Ruth. All this extra from Boaz through Ruth to her. Well, let's see what happens to Naomi in light of Boaz's extra. Look at verse um, 19. Verse 19 says this, and, 
And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today and, and where have you worked? Blessed is the man who took notice of you. And so she, being Ruth, told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Now, here's what's interesting. If you know the book of Ruth, you kind of know how this plays out, but, but Ruth doesn't know who Boaz is. All Ruth knows is she is answering Naomi's question. Naomi's question is, where did you work today? And Ruth says, in this guy's field name, Boaz. All Ruth knows is that this guy, Boaz, is a really great boss to work for. He goes all extra on her. Well, look at Naomi's response. In verse 20, it says this, And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. In other words, Naomi says, this guy Boaz, may he be blessed. And, and what's interesting is you don't know when Naomi says, may his kindness, you don't know if she's referring to Boaz or if she's referring to God. But all of a sudden you see this, this shift in Naomi because, because look at what Boaz's extra did for her. Remember, she had recently told everyone that God had made her bitter by what she had gone through. And her heart had grown bitter, honestly, I think because she was blaming God for what had happened. But here we see something powerful which can happen when we pause for extra because Naomi's heart has changed. She went from call me bitter to blessed. She went from blaming God and here's what's key to seeing the kindness of God. Because notice she says God's kindness has not forsaken. Like this, 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 this word kindness is an important word. Now, she makes this reference to the living and the dead, and that's about marriage and inheritance, and we'll see how that unfolds later. But the point I want to highlight here is Naomi goes from blaming God to seeing what I believe is the kindness of God. And she sees that through Boaz because the word she uses for kindness is important. It's the word hesed. Now, hesed is this Hebrew word that you see scattered throughout the Old Testament, and it's described of God. And, and when it's described of God, it describes God's loving kindness, his faithfulness, his mercy. And it is this particular picture of God that it is his kindness and mercy and love that lasts forever, that it is faithful and never gives up and never stops. And that's what hesed means. And when, she, when Naomi says his kindness, she uses that word hesed, which is a word used to describe God. And she says that his kindness is directed towards me. And so she goes from blaming God to seeing his kindness directed at her. Y'all, all because Boaz gave a little extra. You see, this is what Naomi sees and this is what changes Naomi. And so y'all, here's what we need to understand about the extra that we give. And it's that our extra changes the receiver. Now, if you're tuning in today, I want you to join me on the Facebook Live after this because I want to tell you a story that I don't have time to fit into my message, but I want to save it for Facebook Live about what giving extra does. And I want to tell you a story uh, that I heard last year around Christmas time about how a little extra changed a guy's heart forever. But in here, <coughs> we can see that that extra, just like it changed me and my professor. I mean, when that, my professor gave me that extra credit and that extra honor, it changed me. We see that Boaz giving that little bit of extra to Ruth changed Naomi. And I wonder if you can think of something that someone has done for you where they've given you a little bit of extra that changed you. Maybe it was a thank you note. or Somebody noticed something that you did and so you took the time to write a thank you note and give it to them or drop it in the mail to them. Maybe, maybe it was an extra bonus at work, right? That, that your employer saw you go the extra mile and so they returned the favor. Kids, maybe you've had a rough day before and your mom or dad noticed and they made you a special treat just to lift your spirits and it worked. Maybe someone noticed an ability in you that you haven't even seen and they've spoken to that. They've taken the extra time to give you the opportunity to explore that ability. And that extra time 
gave you the, the, the chance to see something you hadn't seen and all of those extras, maybe, maybe if some of those have been done for you, you've realized all of those extras change you and they change your heart. Well, there's another extra that we're going to see here, too, before we start unpacking this. In verse 20, it says this, And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, uh, the rest of verse 20, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. And Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Now, this idea of redeemer, we're going to see play out in the next few sermons. So, so I'm going to save that for then because it, it, we can see it a lot more clear. So let's just stick a pin in that for right now and know that we'll come back to it. But look at verse 21, and we see even more extra. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, you shall, sh- you shall keep close to my young men until they finish all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It's good, my daughter, that you go out with his, with his young women, least Uh, lest in another field you be assaulted. And so she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now here's why this is important. Remember, if you remember from the beginning of the chapter, she's working in the barley harvest, and barley and wheat weren't harvested at the same time. Barley came first and then wheat. And so, so what Boaz did is he said, listen, I just don't want to give you work for the day. I want to give you work for the entire harvest. And so what he gave her, from the best that my accounts that I can research, is anywhere from six to ten weeks worth of work. Y'all, this would provide for Ruth and Naomi above and beyond what they needed for an entire season. Now, I said we'd talk about two things. I said we'd talk about what giving extra does to the person who receives it. And we've done this. I think we can all agree it feels great to receive extra from somebody else. It elevates us. It changes us. That's, that feels great and it's good. But I also said we would talk about this. I said we'd talk about what does our extra say about ourself? What does our extra say about ourself? Y'all, Naomi saw the kindness of God through the kindness of Boaz. And her heart was changed by this. She saw Boaz's God through his extra. And in this, we see something for each of us to consider, and it's this. That the extra we give shows the God we worship. Right? The extra that we give shows the God that we worship. And we've seen this in the book of Ruth. When you see Boaz, it's so easy to see God and to see God the Father. When we see Boaz, we see this picture of God the Father, right? Because our God loves to go all extra for us. It's what he does and it's who he is. But y'all, there's something else that we need to consider today too. And this is the part where it's going to rub a little bit, all right? So, so just, just know that. But it's this. If the extra we give shows the God we worship, then this is also true. That the extra we give shows the little g gods we worship. And here's what I mean. What we go all extra on shows what you and I worship. And it's not always the big G God. When when people use the little g God, it describes those things that we give our extra to which aren't God. The theological term for those are idols and not not idols that, that are like little statues where you go and worship. It's those little things that we worship in our heart instead of worshiping God. For example, where do you spend your extra time? Where do you spend your extra money? Where do you spend your extra energy? Where do you spend your extra emotion? Because those things might show what you worship. Because here's, here's, God created our hearts to worship. And he longs for that worship to be toward him. And he is gracious when it's not. But he goes all extra lovingly wooing us back to him. Now, I can give you some specific examples to think about. That's what we're going to do. And some of these might rub, right? That's okay. What I want you to do is I want you to pray and I want you to think about the areas of your life where your extra goes. And maybe see if the Holy Spirit will show you that those are places where Jesus would rather you uh, neglect those things and use that extra to draw closer to him. 
Let me ask you this. Do you put your extra in politics? Right? Perfect time of year, perfect year to talk about it. Do you put your extra in politics? If so, here's what this means. It means that your faith might be in politics right now, that that might be your little G God. And if so, it might look like this. If politics is your little G God, oftentimes your faith and hope and security is placed in one political party or one political person. Now, a year ago or so, I did this series called Can We Say That? And I talked specifically about politics. And one of the things, one of the things from that sermon that you'll hear is that God the Father is not a Republican, Jesus isn't a Democrat, and the Libertarian isn't an Independent, right? That our God doesn't fit into one political party. He is much too big for this. Our hope is never in one leader. Our hope is never in one country. And here's why. Proverbs 21.1 says this. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1 says, "The The king's heart is a stream of water, in the Lord's hand, and he directs it wherever he wants it to go. You see, our God is the ruler over the rulers of the earth. Let me ask you this. Is your extra in your savings account? Now, some of you here are like, I don't have a savings account, so I don't have to worry about that. Let me ask you this. Is your extra in your bank account, period? Right? Here's how to know if this is your extra. You give away just enough to not feel guilty. Right? The New Testament model for giving, yeah, this is great. In the Old Testament, you see all these rules about giving and how much you're supposed to give. And and, and for some reason, when we look back on the New Testament, we're drawn to this word tithe and think that they just gave 10% of, of of what they had come into their home. No, if you look at the Old Testament, they actually gave away more like 30% of what came into their home. In the New Testament, in Jesus, you see that shift from from being about numbers to being about the condition of your heart. And and in the New Testament, the standard for giving is that you give joyfully and that you give sacrificially. It means that you give happily and you give till it hurts. Which means as believers, our standard of living could be here. But because of our generosity, our standard of living is intentionally here so that we can give this much away. And that we can do it happily. Now, here's the deal. If your faith is in your savings account, if your faith is in your bank account, if your faith is in your retirement account, your, your, your 401k, like, here's the deal. You worry that you never have enough. I have listened to people with over $100,000, hundreds of thousands of dollars in their kid's college account tell me they don't have enough for their kid's college. I'm like, don't worry about it. They'll be fine. Right? If, 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 if your faith is in your bank account, you find it difficult to enjoy what you do have. How about this one? Is your extra in comfort? Oh, this is, this is mine. This is the one where it hits close to home. This is the one I almost didn't put in the sermon because it hits a little too close to home because I love comfort. I love comfortable furniture. I love comfortable clothes. I love comfort. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is that I love comfort so much, I will actually hold back truth to keep relationships comfortable. And, and I've done a lot of work on this, and I don't do that as much anymore, but I did before because I enjoy staying comfortable instead of following God's plan. And maybe you do this too. And if so, here's what's under that. It's this. It's going extra in control. Now, now, extra in control, here's what's, here's what's tricky about this one if you give your extra to control. Because this one can look noble, and y'all, it can even look holy. Kids and adults too, let me ask you this question. How many of you want things to go your own way? That's what control is. And if a person's faith is in their own ability to do things the right way, that's what control is. And, and when my ability is my God, my little G God, I know it's happening in me because my stress gets high. And here's what it looks like when my stress gets high. I get critical, I get complaining, 
and I get cynical. Y'all, if there's something that a pastor doesn't need in this life of COVID, it's being cynical, right? I can tell when I'm trying to strive for too much control by those things. So let me ask you, is your extra in you? Is your extra in faith in yourself? Let let me tell you something that I've learned in this. And I think this is key. We don't make nearly as good of a God as we think we do. Right? Can I give you a tip for the tr- from the trenches in this? We, we use this phrase on staff, and it's this. It's called Gitmo. Right? And, and you can thank Craig Rochelle uh, for teaching this. He taught it at the Leadership Summit last year. Um, and and, and what, what this means, it's this little phrase that we use around here to make sure that we're not lingering into control. Because you see, if, if your faith is in control... Here's what it means. It means that you don't settle for anything less than 100%. You don't settle for anything less than 110% oftentimes. But here's what I've learned. 80% is good enough if you're one of those people that has a hard time settling for anything less than 100%. If this isn't your thing, then please disregard this Gitmo because you've already got it, right? But for those of us who find only 100% acceptable, here's what Gitmo means. It, do, it means good enough to move on. That's what it means. And if you want, during the Facebook Live, I can show you the graph of, of how this works, but, but that's what it means. It means get enough, good enough to move on. Now, what this does is this helps me keep my faith in God. Because the lie that I believe is if I get it to 100% acceptability, God will do something. The fact of the matter is, God can do something even with 80%. For those of us, uh, for those of us who like control, 80% is really, really good. And so let me ask you, how are you? Did one of these extras resonate with you? Listen, Here's what we all struggle with worshiping little G gods instead of the big G God. That's why the Hesed of God is so important. The kindness, the love, the, the, the faithfulness of God, because it never gives up. And that's why it's so important. Because y'all, our God is the God of extra. And he goes the extra mile over and over again just to show you how good and how faithful and how merciful he is. Our God is the God of extra. And he's always going that extra mile. Jesus' resurrection and crucifixion shows just how far he goes to show us how much that he loves us. And through the forgiveness that Jesus provides, we can see that worshiping something else It's just an opportunity for us to turn away from that and to turn to the God who goes the extra for us. And so for you, if you need to say yes to Jesus' gift of forgiveness, then do that today and place your life in the hands of Jesus and experience a relationship with him today. But for those of us who have already done that, Maybe today is the day you see that thing that you're giving all your extra time, all your extra energy to, all your extra emotion to, and even your extra money to. It's time to lay that down and pick up what Jesus has given you instead. This good and right and personal relationship with the God who loves you and the God who made you. And maybe you've seen these other things taking up all that. And in church, when we do that, and the theological term is called confession and repentance. When we, when we see that as a little G God, confession, and turn to Jesus, how the world sees that. Because what the world sees is they see this person who has peace in the midst of chaos, who has joy in the midst of, of, of this craziness that we live in. And when the world sees that, they start asking us, questions about how they can get it. Y'all, that is my hope for us as a church, that we would be a people who worship God. And in doing so, the world around us wants to do that too. Let's pray. Jesus, 
We all have these little G gods in our heart, and I pray that you would show them to us so that we can see them for what they are, and we can turn from them and instead turn to you, and in that you would be glorified. In Christ's name I pray, amen.